Hello ladies. What would you think if you saw a four or five year old who still looked like a baby? You'd say something is wrong. Babies are supposed to grow. And the same is true spiritually. New converts, all Christians, are supposed to grow spiritually in faith and knowledge and many other ways. But these first century Hebrews readers were not growing. And so the author called them immature babies. We looked in our last lesson at chapter 5, the outline, and we talked about the first part, verses 1 through 10, Jesus is a better high priest. We looked at verses 1 through 3, which show Jesus is better than the human high priests. And 4 and 5, Jesus was called by God to become our high priest. And we ended with verse 6, where the author says, Jesus is our priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. And that is the Messianic prophecy in Psalm 110, verse 4. We'll read that again. Actually, let's read verse 1 and then verse 4 in Psalm 110. They both are familiar Messianic prophecies. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then in verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm with good verses there about the coming Messiah. Now today we're going to begin with verses 7 through 10, that last part of this first point in the outline. And we're going to see Jesus was made perfect through suffering. And we read that in Hebrews 2.10, For it was fitting for him, God, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And there we talked about Jesus becoming perfect through suffering, going through that process. So the author is going to share next a scene of suffering, that heart-wrenching scene in Gethsemane. So let's read this last part, verses 7 through 10, talking about Jesus in Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. Does that sound familiar? To all who obey him. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Doesn't this bring chills? We know that our Lord and Savior experienced that night in the garden. Betrayal, rejection, unfair treatment, pain and suffering. The things we go through and therefore he is able to to understand and empathize and aid us when we go through such experiences. God sent his son into the world as a baby, and he had to go through the human maturity process. Of course, he had to learn good things like morals and manners, but he also faced the painful side of life. We saw in Hebrews 2, 17, Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus learned what we go through so that he could be our high priest and help us and represent us to the Father. So Hebrews 5, 7, to begin today's verses, points to a specific incident in Gethsemane as this verse reads, In the days of his flesh, when Jesus walked the earth, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. Let's read a summary in the study guide, page 45. The experience began on the night before his crucifixion. Three gospels record it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There in Gethsemane, Jesus described his emotional state as deeply distressed and exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He prayed three times for deliverance from the cross. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But he ended each petition with, not as I will, but your will be done. 
Because of his godly fear, which means reverential awe, which implies a total submission to his Father, Jesus' prayers were answered. He would submit to the cross, but God sent an angel to strengthen him in his distress. Have you faced death, maybe a terminal illness, or even threat by an assailant? It gives us comfort to know that Jesus felt that anxiety. He understands what we feel like and what we go through. He begged, praying with passionate pleas and prayers to God. In Matthew 26, 39, this is how Jesus prayed, Oh, my Father, please let this cup pass from me. To paraphrase, he was saying, Father, please don't make me go through this cross. Please take this away. And do we not sometimes have fears or pain or crises and we pray, God, please take this away. Jesus knows what it feels like. Hebrews 4.15, if you take out the double negative, it says we do have a high priest who can sympathize with us. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to the one who could save him from death on the cross. But where would we be if he had? We would have no way of salvation, no way of forgiveness of sins, no way to go to heaven. Hebrews 5, 7 continues, But he was heard because of his godly fear. God heard Jesus' request, but he also heard Jesus' submissive statement, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Do we pray this way? Do we go boldly to the throne of grace and passionately plea whatever our request is, but then humbly, willingly, ask God to let his will be done? Do we actually show enough fear and awe in God to understand and believe that the Father knows best? God heard and answered Jesus' prayer. The prayer was that God's will be done, and that's exactly what happened. God's will was done. Jesus did go to the cross. Neil Lightfoot wrote that God may have answered his prayer not only in the, uh, the request that God's will be done, but God eased his fear, and he spared him from premature death in the garden. We mentioned earlier that it was God's will that Jesus die on the cross, not in the garden. So God sent a strengthening angel, and he helps us too in our sufferings. Hebrews 5, 8, 9 next show what this excruciating experience did for Jesus. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That's verse 8. Let's stop there. Wait. It says Jesus learned obedience. Wasn't he always obedient? Parents, listen carefully to this application for raising our children. True obedience means doing what we're told to do, not only what we want to do. If, we, if our children do only what they want to do, that's not true obedience. Offering them candy to do what we want them to do only teaches them to do what they want to do, not what they're told to do. God never bribed Jesus to go to the cross. Jesus went willingly. He obeyed. Ross Dudry wrote, As the Gospels present Jesus' struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed there repeatedly, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. That is, Father, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Hebrews concludes that through facing squarely such struggles as Gethsemane and winning through to obedience, despite his own wishes to the contrary, Jesus became qualified as our high priest. Study guide on page 45 concurs. It says, to be better equipped for his priestly function, he, Jesus, had to go through a refinement process and learn perfect or true obedience. Of course, Jesus had always obeyed the Father, but accepting the cross was a challenge. His human side did not want to go through that agony. In the garden, Jesus accepted God's will his will to die on the cross, even when he didn't want to. Hebrews 5, 9, it tells the results. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation. And we saw that in verse 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. To all who obey him. Let's look at the word perfect here. 
We learn in chapter 2 that Jesus came to earth in the form of a human and had to go through the human maturity process and had to become perfect. God saw fit for him to become perfect through suffering in Hebrews 2.10. And so the word perfect there we learn meant mature or complete. So Jesus had to go through this process through suffering. And 2.10 says this perfection process was necessary for Jesus to become the author of our salvation. And then verse 9 says he did become the author of our salvation, having been perfected. But it says to all those who obey him. Martel Pace in Truth For Today said, Obedience is never perfected until it is done without question. When we have completely obeyed, we are then made perfect, entire, and mature as saints. So we as Christians must learn that kind of obedience. Perfect obeying what God says. You know, the Christian life is not a cafeteria style religion where you get to pick and choose which commands you obey and which ones you don't obey. We must obey all of God's commands. So Jesus became perfected, mature, complete through his sufferings and became the author of salvation to all those who obey him. And it doesn't say all those who just believe in him but all those who obey him. So Hebrews 5, 7 through 9 should give us comfort that Jesus understands when we go through our struggles, illness, grief, financial crisis, problems with our children, our parents, our co-workers, whatever we go through, we have to understand that these sufferings will perfect us. And we read that in James 1, 2 through 4. We're very familiar with that one. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So the sufferings mature us. They make us come out better, not bitter, when we look at it in the right way. Count it all joy and let God help you through it. Jesus willingly went through these sufferings that produced perfection or maturity in him so that he could do and be what God wanted. And God rewarded him. Philippians 2, 8, and 9. It's a beautiful verse about, it says what we've been learning here. Philippians 2, 8, and 9. And being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. We too must humbly and willingly obey what God says, go through the sufferings, and counting it all joy, let it perfect and mature us. Then we too can do and be what God wants. The study guide on page 46 the trials that perfect us form the crosses we must bear. As in the garden, God does not always take away trials, but he does provide strength to endure them. There's an old phrase that says God doesn't take away our storms, but he helps us through them. Well, God helped Jesus through that suffering in the garden, and he will help us through our sufferings. We just trust him because the Father knows best. William Barclay, in his commentary, commented on this concept. He said, things happen to every one of us in this world that we cannot understand. It is then that faith is tried to its utmost limits. And at such a time, it is sweetness to the soul to know that in Gethsemane, Jesus went through that too. Every man and woman has our own private Gethsemane and every one of us has to learn to say, thy will be done. I have two reflection questions that you can discuss or consider at the end of this lesson. One is consider a specific trial that you went through that you feel like produced some spiritual maturity, made you stronger, made you better. Second, read Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 and Philippians 2, 8, and 9 that we read and describe the perfect obedience that Jesus had to learn. Now we have one more verse in chapter 5, and that's verse 10. It says, talking about Jesus, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And that harks back to some verses we read earlier. God called him to the high priesthood, 
and it's after the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? The author is about to explain and compare Jesus' priesthood to the ancient priest and king Melchizedek. But the author stops. He doesn't want to go forward because he realizes these Hebrew first century Christians are not spiritually mature enough to understand. So we have the second part of our outline. Here in verses 11 through 14, the writer rebukes readers for their spiritual laziness. In verses 11 and 12, he says they have neglected Bible study, which helps us grow. And in verses 13 and 14, he tells them they need to grow in spiritual maturity. So our study guide on page 47 points out, twice in chapter 5, the Hebrews writer referred to the ancient priest and king Melchizedek. He wanted to present more information about this man as a type and shadow of Christ, but it was hard for him to communicate. His readers lacked the spiritual maturity to understand. And we know these readers were immature. They didn't have depth and strength of faith because they were ready to just throw it out the window and head back to Judaism. Martel Pace wrote, The maturity that the writer desired for the Christians to whom he wrote was a capability to grasp and appreciate truth on an advanced level. It's sad when men and women who have been Christians for years are found to be unaware of spiritual realities which should have given great meaning, appeal, and power for them. We need some spiritual realities that will give power to our life and help us to persevere, to keep on keeping on in the Christian walk. And just like physical babies, if Christians don't grow, there's something wrong. They're not able to thrive in Christianity. Look at Hebrews 5.11. It's talking about the priesthood of Christ, and that is one of those spiritual realities that we really need to understand. We need to understand those benefits that he has for us, that he helps us through this Christian life. But he can't talk about this priesthood of Jesus, verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. In Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, he rebukes those readers for their neglect of Bible study, and he says they are dull of hearing. It's mental laziness. It's sluggishness. They're not really studying the Word or paying attention or doing what it says. And dull of hearing is the third of the five warnings that we talked about earlier. Let's review. Do not drift from the Word in Hebrews 2. Do not doubt the Word in Hebrews 3 and 4. And here, Today, in this lesson, do not become dull toward the word, beginning with verse 11 and going through 620. Do not despise the word, we'll see in Hebrews 10, and do not defy the word, we will see in Hebrews 12. So these Hebrews Christians had not been doing any deep Bible study of the scriptures, and so they were in this downward spiral toward apostasy. So we have the study guide on page 48. Lack of Bible study produces spiritual sluggishness. Does this describe you? It can happen to anyone. These readers had been washed and enlightened, had tasted the goodness of God's word, and had once lived a consistent Christian lifestyle. They may have lived in Jerusalem, the buckle of the ancient Bible belt, where Peter and Paul had preached, but they had become mentally lazy, dull of hearing, and had actually regressed Leon Morris and Donald Burdick in their commentary noted that in the Christian life, one either moves forward or slips back. It's almost impossible to stand still. These readers needed a rebuke for their condition, so the writer digressed from his discussion of Melchizedek and Christ's priesthood to write verses 11 and 12 here. If the author of Hebrews was writing to you about the priesthood of Christ, could he have continued? Or would he have stopped and rebuked you for not knowing enough of God's Word? Do we take advantage of all the opportunities we have to study God's Word? We have so many. Think about the times where we have Bible class and preaching offered in the worship assembly and in the classes with our church family. And also online, so many online. And you can make opportunities 
As I mentioned a few weeks ago, our ladies get together on Wednesdays at one o'clock for a Zoom devotional. And we learn so many little nuggets of, of truth from God's word. Recently, we studied Lot's wife. We may study another woman in the Bible or maybe a chapter like we looked at Psalm 91 and, and, the, and how God sends the angels to protect us. So many things that are available. Well, the Hebrews readers were neglecting their opportunities to study God's word and to grow. And so the writer needed to give them this wake-up call. So he called them spiritually immature babies. The study guide on page 48 talks about this concept here. No one likes to be called a baby. This humiliating metaphor surely got their attention. Perhaps the writer used reverse psychology, hoping they would take the dare and be willing to jump in as he leaps into the theological depths. The rebuke was not a pleasant task, but it was necessary to save their souls. When we're baptized, we're spiritually born again. Then, like physical babies, we must grow. Peter exhorted new Christians, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, 2. Milk provides nourishment for infants until they're able to digest solid food. In the same way, new converts must learn simple truths of God's word before they can understand deeper concepts. They would choke on more complex and challenging theological material, but in time, they must learn to handle meat. These Hebrews were not unique in their spiritual immaturity. Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth and said the same thing. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. And Ephesians, he called them children. So this is the state of those who don't know God's word and are not growing. There comes a time when Christians must grow and be knowledgeable and mature, and they should be teaching others. But not so with these readers. Look at Hebrews 5 in our text for today, verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, they should be teaching others. But it says instead you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. The study guide comments. The Hebrew Christians needed to advance from spiritual childhood to maturity. That is from milk to meat. In fact, enough time had passed that they should have already been teaching others. Each of us is to be ready always to give an answer concerning our hope. 1 Peter 3.15 Although we may not teach formal Bible classes, we must share the gospel with others. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, Mark 16, 15, and 16. We are commanded to study, learn, grow, and teach. These readers were not growing, neither were they teaching. They were dull of hearing. They were sluggish. They were stagnant. They were mentally lazy. They had regressed, as we read earlier by Morris and Burdick. It's impossible to stand still. So we want to move forward. But they had regressed. They had forgotten the oracles, the simple first principles of God's word. And they needed to relearn those basics. Then they could digest deeper, meatier concepts. Now in Hebrews 6, in our next lesson, we'll look at some of these basics that we need to learn as new converts. And that is, includes faith and repentance and others. And these are things that all new converts and young Christians need to learn. But, you know, we're all on different levels of maturity. There are, in every class and in every audience of every sermon, there are those that are non-Christians, there are seekers, there are young baby Christians, new converts. There are those who have been Christians for a little while and are in the process of beginning their growth. And then there are those mature Christians who know the Bible very well. So preachers and teachers have the awesome responsibility of presenting milk and meat. And we can always learn. We never arrive. We never learn it all. Some think that just knowing the basics is enough. In the pulpit commentary, Jones says this, It is pitiful and painful to reflect upon the prevalence of spiritual obtuseness in our own age. How many Christians are perfectly content 
and self-satisfied, having only the barest rudiments of Scripture truth. Some even pride themselves in holding the truth, as though they had grasped and mastered all truth. And in their firm adherence to the simple gospel, as though there were no profundities and sublimities in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we fear that the Bible is far more widely circulated than read and far more extensively read than studied or understood. We've got to get beyond the basics. We never learn it all. And you know, every time you read something in Scripture, you always learn something. It's living and powerful, this Word of God. And it's important for individuals and churches to get into the deep meat in order to grow. And the study guide explains that the prescription for churches and members who are tired and lethargic is to eat some meat. In fact, Paul told Titus in Titus 2.1 to preach sound doctrine. And the word sound there is hugiano. It means healthy. It is the root of the English term hygiene. It means properly in good working order, hence healthy and sound condition. It's the opposite of having a debilitating sickness. And when Titus was preaching on the island of Crete, there were spiritual diseases everywhere. And so he taught health-producing scripture, truth. And that's something that we all need to do is learn the truth, not just the basics, but get into the meat. That's what helps us to grow. So the meat of the word is necessary for spiritual growth. And the Hebrews writer ended verse 12 by saying, you have come to need milk and not solid food. They still needed to go back and learn those elementary principles. For, uh, page 50. Elementary principles will sustain for a while, but to maintain vitality for a long period, we need depth and roots. These readers were spiritually immature because they did not study. Sisters, how many of us can be diagnosed with this deficiency? We need meat. Now let's read the final two verses in chapter 5, which comment on in verse 13 what happens to Christians when they do not get solid food. They just live on milk. And verse 14, what happens when we do uh, get the meat of the word? Verses 13 and 14. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, a baby. And 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Verse 13 implies that we need more than just the basic elements of the Christian faith. We need to grow. And 2 Peter 1, 5, 8 tells us how to grow. That's one of those verses Mom made us learn. It says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And it's talking about knowledge of God's Word. We must learn and study diligently with much effort, earnest effort. We must learn God's Word. Many believe that they know the Bible just because they've learned a few facts. But they really don't. I want to give a sad but humorous illustration of one person who thought he knew the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, as best as I can recall, there was a Good Samaritan traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and they sprang up and choked him and left him half dead. But a man came by feeding his swine, and he said to the man, I will arise and go to my father. So he took up his bed and walked. But while the soldiers were chasing him through the forest, he got the hair of his head caught in a tree, and he was left hanging there for forty days and forty nights. And the ravens fed him. Just then Delilah came along with a pair of scissors, and she cut off his hair, and he fell on stony ground. But the good master of the house resurrected the man, and he journeyed on his way. All of a sudden he came to the wall of Jericho, and there was Jezebel sitting on the wall, and she mocked him. And he said, Throw her down to the dogs. And they threw her down seventy times seven. And great was the fall thereof. And of the fragments that remained, they picked up twelve baskets full. And whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? Now this is rather humorous, but can you imagine this man trying to explain some deeper concepts of Scripture? He can't even explain the simple ones. 
2 Timothy 2.15 tells us we are to study and rightly divide the word of truth. Let's look at page 50 in the study guide. Lack of Bible knowledge keeps one immature and naive, unable to discern good from evil. Verse 13 that we read. Babies do not have the ability to discriminate between good and bad, and they often put harmful things in their mouth. People who do not know right from wrong are also in danger. Spiritual discernment is not inborn. It must be sharpened by two things. One, right teaching, which comes by studying the word of righteousness. And two, right reasoning, which comes by exercising the word in life experiences. God's word provides right teaching, but we must read, meditate, and study in order to understand and apply it. Then we must use this knowledge in everyday life. Paul said we must exercise ourselves spiritually, 1 Timothy 4, 7. The term exercise is from gunazo, and gymnasium comes from that root, meaning to train the body or mind. Biblical study and practice will help us learn discernment between good and evil. Knowledge from God's Word helps us to understand and be able to discern good from evil. Do you remember we talked about the bank teller and how they learned to distinguish counterfeit bills from true ones by learning what true ones look like and feel like? Well, sadly, in our world today, people don't know how to distinguish good from evil. And Isaiah 5.20 said, Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. And who would have thought some of the things we see today that are evil are being accepted? Well, according to 5.14, as we mature, we can digest those meaty, advanced, solid concepts in Scripture. But solid food belongs to those who are full age, those who, by using it, have their senses exercised to learn both good and evil. So we know God's word, we learn it, and when we practice it in our daily life, we can distinguish good from evil. As mentioned, it comes through right teaching, which is studying the word, and right reasoning by exercising or applying that word in our daily lives. And those individuals and congregations that never go beyond the basics and never take in the meat and the more advanced concepts are vulnerable to false teaching and they're vulnerable like those first century Christians to quitting their faith and going to some other faith somewhere. So how is your how are you individual and how are, is your congregation? One more reading here, 51. The answer for a tired church and depressed members is spiritual meat, knowledge of the scriptures. Drifting from the word produces doubt of its inspiration and its ability to relate to modern circumstances. Those in this downward spiral become dull of hearing and will seek solutions outside of Scripture. By listening to other voices, their teachings and practices will no longer identify them as the Lord's church. Sisters, consider implementing a daily Bible reading schedule for yourself and members of your congregation. And there's a lot of good material out there. I wanted to share with you something that and I wrote it, I put it in Struggle, Seek, and Grow, which is a book on spiritual maturity. And it is an adaptation from Rosemary Whittle McKnight's book, I Love Me, I Love Me Not. But it is some suggestions for making time or to get into a habit of daily Bible study. Here are those suggestions. First, make an appointment for personal time in the Word. You can set your alarm for 15 minutes early in the morning, or you can do this late at night while the kiddos are in bed. You can make a period of time during your lunch break to study God's Word. Uh, or when you're sitting and waiting for appointments. How many times do we sit somewhere and we're waiting? We can use that time wisely to study God's Word. Two, have a plan for personal time in the Word. Find a daily Bible reading schedule or devotional guide. and They're available everywhere, maybe in your church library. Uh, at Christian bookstores. You can find them online. Just this morning I was looking up a Greek word on the internet and up pops a daily Bible reading schedule. You can enjoy a topical study. Pick a topic from the Bible like love or baptism uh, and use concordances, topical Bibles, Bible encyclopedias. Maybe study a city, Jerusalem. Use a Bible atlas. There's so much to learn. Find commentaries for a textual study. Maybe you want to study the book of John or Mark or the book of Proverbs. 
you can get Bible commentaries and learn the insights from scholars who know the culture and the history and the language and learn things that we couldn't figure out on our own. Study for a class that you're teaching or one that you're attending. Could you imagine if everyone in the Sunday morning adult Bible class had studied the material that the teacher will present? And that what a discussion there will be there. Acts 17, 11, the Bereans were more noble because they looked in the word to see that what the teacher said or the preacher said was true. Three, make use of idle moments for personal time in the word. There are times when your body is busy, but your mind may not be, such as when you're washing dishes. Um, you can listen to Bible recordings or sermons when we lived in Leoma, Tennessee, we drove 30 minutes to take our children to Mars Hill Bible School in Florence, Alabama. So we played Bible tapes for the boys to listen to. And I think they grew, we all grew a lot during those years. You can place text for memorizing the Bible on index cards and put it places where you will see it frequently, maybe at the kitchen sink or on your bathroom mirror. Keep some in your purse. And keep a small Bible in your purse. You never know when those moments that you'll be sitting and waiting for an appointment or for the kids to get out of school. Or that we have a lot of times when we're sitting and waiting. And we can take that time as an opportunity to, to grow. The purpose is to develop a habit of Bible study. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And we do need faith. We need a strong faith in order to persevere and to keep on keeping on. And that's why those first century Christians were struggling. They didn't have the Bible knowledge, so they didn't have the faith necessary to keep them going. And that's what Hebrews is all about. Persevere. Learn. Read. So let's look at the study guide and read the summary of chapter 5 and the forward look to chapter 6. The Hebrews writer was concerned about his readers drifting, doubting, and becoming dull of hearing. Some admired the earthly splendor of the Jewish high priesthood, but Jesus fulfilled that role in a better way. He is the compassionate, sinless, sacrificial lamb, perfected by his obedience unto death on the cross and called by God as high priest. His position is greater than Aaron's, for he was appointed according to the royal priestly order of Melchizedek. Readers were too spiritually immature to understand this. Their lack of Bible study had produced an inability to comprehend complex truths in God's Word. Therefore, they failed in their natural progression to grow and share the gospel. In Hebrews 6, the writer will encourage his readers to press on to maturity. He explained how to grow spiritually through deep Bible study. He commended their love and good works and encouraged them to trust God's promises. Abraham was used as an example. If they wanted to enter God's rest, they needed to diligently work towards spiritual maturity. This would help them withstand persecution and persevere all the way to the end. So I hope that this lesson has helped you or inspired you to get deep into God's Word and to grow and to get past the milk stage to the meat stage. Let's look at the three discussion questions for you to, to uh, consider. First, consider a specific trial that produced spiritual maturity in your life. Second, read Hebrews 5, 8, 9 and Philippians 2, 8, 9 and describe the perfect obedience Jesus had to learn. And three, how does a lack of Bible knowledge make one vulnerable to false teaching? Discuss ways to make time for Bible study.